Welcome to Night School. I'm Aria. And I'm Darian. And whether you're new to Night School or you're a regular, we are so happy that you're here. We're a program of Nightlife at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And Nightlife is an in-person event that mixes science and culture and art every single Thursday night. And Night School, which you're watching right now, is our little online version of that. Specifically tonight, you are watching Night School Hardcore, which we know is absolutely an intense name, but I can assure you all that tonight's program will be entirely 100% deserving of it. Maybe you've cored an apple before. Well, our guests have cored it all, from soils to buildings to deep sea diatomaceous sediment. Tonight, we're learning how these excavated cylinders made of apparently anything can help <laughs> us learn about our past and plan for our future across the fields of pelagic ecology, dendrochronology, and biogeochemistry. It's a big night for syllables. Aria, who do we have the pleasure of hearing from tonight? <laughs> yeah, first up, we have Dr. Elizabeth Seibert, who's a scientist with the Department of Geology and Geophysics at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And she's a paleontologist and a biological oceanographer, getting to those syllables. And today, she'll be sharing with us lots of tiny teeth and little scales from million-year-old sharks and fishes. Super cool, but even cooler is how all of those teeth and scales can contribute to a bigger understanding of how fish and shark species across the last 80 million years have responded to mass extinction and climate change events, and how that might better how that might help us better understand future ecosystem responses to global change. And next up, we have Dr. Megan Rockner, who is a ge geography professor at University of Louisville, and she's also a dendrochronologist, which is also known as a tree ring scientist. And what even are tree rings? Over time, new tree growth forms layers that all are different based on different environmental conditions. And Megan will tell us a lot more about that. And she'll be introducing us to just all of the basics of tree ring science and its wide range of applications from anthropology to climate science to environmental history, to name a few. In other words, trees can teach us a whole lot. And closing out our program tonight is Dr. Claudia Christina Villa, a biogeochemist and soil scientist. She's a fellow with the inaugural cohort of the Stanford Earth Postdoctoral Fellowship, and will be starting as a professor at the University of San Diego this fall. And tonight, She'll give us just a little glimpse into the wondrous world of dirt. Like it's it's just so much more than a source of nutrients and you know dirt. But basically, she'll be talking about how studying uh, dirt and soil can offer an incredibly special perspective on the environments around us. There's a lot of syllables tonight. <laughs> As always, tonight's program is live. So whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch, say hi. Let us know where in the world you're watching from, whether it's your first time joining us or you're a night school regular and it's your 84th time joining us. I counted. <laughs> this is episode 84. <laughs> we are so happy you're here. We will have a Q&A after each speaker. So put any questions that come up in the comments in the chat or in the chat. And with that, we will pass it on to Dr. Elizabeth Seibert. All right, hello. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and thanks so much Darian and Aria for the opportunity to share a little bit about what I think about and why I think it's exciting with all of you. Um, so my talk today is called Tales from Tiny Fossils, a Fishy History from the Bottom of the Sea. And what I'll do is share a little bit about how we get these fossils and what kinds of tales they can tell us. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey because I think that's always a little bit interesting. I always love hearing what other folks have done. And so I'm one of those people who always wanted to be a marine biologist. And I think I actually ended up winning the little kid dream job lottery um, because I'm a cross now between a marine biologist and a paleontologist. Um, and I've been through a whole bunch of different directions during that time. Um, I spent my high school years learning everything I could learn about the ocean. 
Um, and then I went to college and I actually got my start in research looking at cores of a totally different kind that aren't really going to be mentioned today. So I'm just going to mention them briefly. And those are coral cores um, where you can actually drill into corals and look at their recent history over the last couple years or tens of years or even hundreds if you're lucky to look at coral recovery and response to major climate changes in that kind of time scale. Um, I did my bachelor's in San Diego and then stayed at Scripps Institution of Oceanography for a master's and PhD before moving back across the country to Massachusetts, where I spent a couple of years at Harvard, mostly working with CT scans and trying to figure out what fish look like from the inside. Um, I just spent the last three years as a postdoctoral fellow at Yale and about two weeks ago started my job at Woods Hole Oceanographic. So I've been sort of bouncing around a little bit and I'm really excited to be able to continue doing this kind of work, hopefully long time into the future. I also um, have this really fun little secret life and I said that I won the little kid dream job lottery by being a cross between a paleontologist and a marine biologist, but I also actually ran away with the circus as well and I've spent the last about 20 years of my life as a professional circus artist and coach. And so I challenge you to find the remaining handstand pictures scattered somewhere in this talk. Um, I like to take pictures of handstands all over the world. All right, so um, enough about that. Let's talk about the science. So I love the ocean and I love all sorts of things about it. And one of my big questions is how do fish and marine ecosystems, so sort of the part of the ocean that's living, how does that respond to global change? And there's a whole bunch of different ways you can go about doing this. But for me, one of the things that's really interesting is that marine ecosystems, at least in the modern ocean, have some really cool predictive patterns. So we can take just from knowing that the earth is round and it's tilted and it's spinning and knowing where the continents are, we can actually predict to a pretty good first order approximation where ocean circulation is going to happen. Um, and that's because heat transfers from the equators to the poles and the earth is spinning, so it moves water in a predictive way. Um, and that ocean circulation can actually give us a really good prediction of where nutrients, where food for the um, phytoplankton that live in the surface ocean will be. And it also can give us a pretty good indicator of what kinds of temperatures and salinities and other kind of physical conditions that the ocean might have in different places in the ocean. This all feeds into what kind of plankton you might find in different parts of the ocean. And in fact, in certain regions like this upper high productivity region, we might have a lot of more diverse plankton um, whereas in a lower productivity region, like the South Pacific, where I've highlighted here, we might have a much smaller or, um, and lower density or lower diversity group of phytoplankton. Um, these phytoplankton, in turn, fuel the base of the food web, and that can tell us where we might find fish and sharks and whales and other large marine consumers. It'll also tell us about how many of them we might find and potentially even what kinds. And so I'm really interested in understanding what happens if we change those physical conditions. What if the planet gets a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler? What if there's a major extinction or a loss of some biodiversity? What might happen to the rest of the food chain? And can we use those changes, the base of the food web, to understand what happens at the top of the food web, so those fish and sharks, or even can we use this understanding of what fish and sharks are doing as a way to better understand or maybe predict or suggest what kinds of changes may be happening in the physical conditions? Um, so Basically, to me, what's most interesting about this is that the ocean is really very linked from the base of the food web all the way up to the top. Um, and this, this then gives us the opportunity to understand or study how ecosystems might respond to change. And there's a whole bunch of different tools that you can use to look at how marine ecosystems respond to change. You can look directly, you can do experiments. Um, you can be on the boat and the water, or you can use satellites, you can even make biogeochemical models that might help explain how different 
groups of organisms or different physical characteristics of the ocean could change based on changing environmental parameters. Now, my preferred tool is not any of these. My preferred tool is to actually look not at future change, but at past change. And one thing that's really interesting to me is that the Earth is an incredibly dynamic planet. So the climate change that we are currently undergoing today is happening incredibly fast, and it's at an unprecedented rate. We don't have really any analogs to it in the past in terms of its speed. But the planet has gone, undergone enormous changes throughout its four and a half billion year history. And what I've done here is just made this little infographic showing us the last about 540 million years of Earth's history with some important but in, and interesting intervals highlighted. Um, you can see we've got a big change in where the continents are, for example. Um, there's been a series of mass extinctions. There's been extreme glaciation, extreme ice house, um, rise and fall of all sorts of different organisms. Basically, the Earth is full of examples of global change. And what I'm excited about and what I like to try and do is understand those bits of global change and to look at how things have changed in the past and how organisms respond so that we can get an idea of what repeated patterns might be happening. Um, every time the Earth gets warmer, what happens to fish? Um, if the Earth gets warmer five times in its history, um, maybe we can look at the similarities in those patterns to see what might be predictive of this. Now, going back in time is a challenge. And so I want to introduce you to my truly favorite tool of um, marine science. And this is the Joides Resolution. The Joides Resolution is this very large drill ship. It's actually, we joke, it's the only boat that goes around the entire world's ocean, sticking itself into the seafloor and hoping to not find oil. Because actually what the Joides Resolution is, is a real life time machine. And it's basically the closest you'll ever get to being on like the Starship Enterprise, for example, because it's staffed by scientists from all over the world, from all sorts of different disciplines. And it's a really, really cool tool. But what does it collect? So the JOIDES, or we call it the JR for short, um, is a really neat instrument because it can drill into the ocean floor. But why do we care about the ocean floor? What can that tell us? Well, if this is an example of a marine ecosystem, and I've put some different organisms into this marine ecosystem, um, all of these organisms produce some kind of either physical hard part that gets preserved or some kind of chemical trace that we can detect in marine sediments. And so when they die, they fall to the seafloor and they start to accumulate in these little layers. And the joinies comes along and it sticks a core down into the bottom of the seafloor, sometimes going down hundreds of meters down into the seafloor, um, upwards of a kilometer, I believe, is the longest of the cores that it's ever collected. And the deeper you go, the farther back in time you get. And so we end up with these absolutely spectacular marine sediment cores dating back sometimes 130 to 200 million years old, though usually we don't get quite that old because most of that crust has been subducted already. Um, and those can give us an absolutely incredible archive of ancient oceans. Now, I'm a paleontologist, so I'm really excited about the organic things, the biological things that live or that are found in sediment cores. Um, so Th these things are generally what we call microfossils or microscopic fossils. Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. There's diatoms, which are primary producers, as well as coccolithophores. Um, my, one of my professors in grad school said that diatoms are basically little Brussels sprouts that are covered in glass, and coccolithophores are basically little Brussels sprouts that are covered in chalk. They both do photosynthesis and when um, make these little outside shells, and when they die, those shells accumulate on the seafloor. But we don't just have primary producers. We also have radiolarians and foraminifera and ostracods, which are all examples of zooplankton, things that are eating that primary production. Um, in addition to those microfossils, we also can get really diverse geochemical signals out of these sediment cores, which can be used to reconstruct everything from past ocean temperature to CO2 to ocean circulation. So what we can really get is a whole picture of the physical conditions of the ocean, those phytoplankton, and starting to go up the food web. 
And because ocean sediments accumulate relatively continuously, because it's actually pretty hard to disturb the bottom of the ocean, we can get really high resolution records of life and climatic interactions, which is a really fantastic tool. Um, the Joinius has actually been around since 1983, and it was replaced the Wilmar Challenger, which was the first ocean scientific ocean drilling ship. And I just want to take a moment to say that ocean drilling turned, I want to say, 55 this year, started in 1968. And it's sadly, um, the Joides is being retired next year. So if you think this kind of work is really exciting, um, we're trying to convince the rest of the world that it is very exciting so that we can continue doing this kind of work and collecting these sediments. Um, it's also really cool to be able to go back and look at sediments that were collected 50 years ago, um, because they can actually tell us all sorts of things about the planet. And so I actually um, work on a fairly unique microfossil. You can see them behind me, but now I'd like to introduce you to them. So, um, oh, actually, I, I, I changed my mind. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about being on the Joides as well, because that's kind of fun. Um, so I spent some time on the Joides uh, a couple of years ago, actually, right before the pandemic. Um, these are just some pictures of what life on the ship looks like. Um, and collecting these cores is a really specialized job. It's actually, there it takes a dedicated team of um, technicians and engineers to be able to drill from the surface of the ocean, getting piped down sometimes thousands of meters of water depth and then collecting the sediment. And so it's a really specialized job that they've been developing expertise over for 40, for over 50 years at this point. And it gives us a treasure trove of information about what kinds of things we can find in the ocean floor and how to get a good record out of it. So that I'm just showing you all sorts of pictures of cores because I love cores and they, they are an amazing little time machine. So now I'd like to spend the last little chunk of time introducing you to my favorite fossils. So these are ichthyoliths. This is another one for those syllables. Um, ichthyolith means fish stone, and they are a microfossil proxy for fish and sharks. Um, they're made up mostly of teeth and scales, um, and they're made of bioappetite or calcium phosphate. That's the same stuff that your teeth are made of. And that means that they actually are really easy to preserve. They are preserved in basically all marine sediment types. Um, they're really, really small. Most of them are smaller than your uh, the width of one of your hairs, um, but they're actually really abundant. So if you have the patience to spend hours and hours staring down um, a microscope, you can get all sorts of really cool information about fish and sharks, in addition to all of those other microfossil groups that I highlighted. Um, I just want to take a moment and say that fish are actually really important because they are the most diverse group of vertebrates on the planet. And you and I might have a much better understanding of what it is to be a fish than say what it is to be a forum or a diatom. Also, fish are a really important protein source and source of livelihood for a huge population and um, huge proportion of the world. And um, it's really important to understand how fish respond to change in order to be able to mitigate future global warming. Also, fish are cool, and that's really worth it, worthwhile. Um, so I think of fish as an ecosystem proxy. They can tell us things about how much energy is available in the ecosystem, who is present, and even what kinds of evolutionary changes we can find within the system. Um, now, I mentioned getting teeth out of sediments is a good challenge. I spent the majority of my PhD refining methods, and I'm just showing you a really neat little flow chart. One of the things we do is dye them bright pink, which makes them a little bit easier to find. Um, I have picked over 150,000 of these little teeny tiny fossils, but it turns out they actually all fit in this little box, um, which fits quite neatly under the seat in front of you in an airplane. So it's a great little little box that can tell us a lot about Earth's history. Um, so now for a wee little bit of science. I'm gonna take you all back to a really bad Thursday evening, I know, sorry, um, when an asteroid slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula and caused the end of the reign of the dinosaurs. Now this was a really bad day for many, many, many organisms on planet Earth. And I wanted to know what happened to the fish. Now we know that there was a change in primary production and we know that there was an extinction of marine predators, but fish actually live right in the middle of those two things. And so we wanted to know what was going on with the fish. 
And I'm actually just going to have you all do a little bit of that science questioning with me. Um, I'm going to show you two assemblages, one from before the extinction and one from after the extinction. And I'd like to spend a second having you all guess which one of these you think is from before the extinction event. I hope that we can put these in the comments. Anyone got some, some guesses? Perhaps? Um, all right, so I bet some of you thought it was B. B is not actually from before the extinction. B is from after the extinction. And it turns out that um, this pattern that we see of relatively low diversity of fish and relatively low abundance of fish before the extinction is very common. And we see a much bigger diversity after the extinction. I'll tell you that I actually um, got my, I thought that I'd like flipped all of my sediments upside down, but it turns out that this is true everywhere we've looked. And I've done a bunch of work to try and quantify this. Um, I'm gonna just show you a couple of those things. One of them is looking at the ratio of teeth to scales. And we can actually put our fingers on the moment that the extinction happened because before the extinction, the ratio of teeth to scales is one way and after the extinction, it's another way. Um, we can also look at tooth diversity and this is a kind of cool way of looking at things. Um, and I have a colleague who likes to tease me that all I do all day is look at teeny tiny triangles that are basically like ice cream cones. But the thing is that if you look at ice cream cones long enough, they start to look different. And you can start plotting them through time and looking at patterns of origination and extinction. And so I've done some really fun, like magical paleo map. And what we find is that we don't actually see an extinction in the fish, but what we do see is a lot of origination after the event. So mass extinction, good for fish? Possibly. It's actually a kind of a cool story. Um, and so one of the other things that we can do is we can actually look at not just the um, origination and extinction rates, but we can actually look at sort of where all of these fish fit in terms of their communities and how the community has changed through time. And now I'm just showing you some slices of fish communities, again, with some magic paleo math that shows that before the extinction, things are one way. And then after the extinction, there's some big changes in the community as we move through time. And so really, this is a really cool story because what we found is that actually the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, this mass extinction that killed the dinosaurs was a great time to be a fish in the ocean. And we can do that just by looking at these kinds of pictures of little teeny tiny teeth. And so that's what I want to leave you with, is that these sediment cores can give us really amazing records from before, during, and after climate events. And by looking at the fossils in them, we can tell all of these really spectacular stories. So I want to bring us just to end with this question of how do fish and marine ecosystems respond to global change? Well, it's complicated and depends on the event. But deep sea sediments can be a really excellent treasure trove of information for asking that question. And one little note of hope is that it seems like in the face of at least some exist, of, of some extinctions and some big changes, fish may be actually one of the more resilient groups of organisms to global change. And that's, that to me, is some really good news. And so I will say thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any of the questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that presentation. Um, we've got, received a lot of great questions in the comments, but I'd encourage our audience to continue to ask and we will get to as many as we can. Um, so James asks, how old do sediments have to get before they become compressed enough to become fossilized or rocks? So that is a fantastic question. Um, so one thing that's notable is that in the deep ocean, um, we consider anything that comes from the seafloor, from seafloor sediments, as long as it's not right in the core top, we consider that to be fossil material, even if it hasn't had the chemical replacements that you think of as sort of fossilization for, say, dinosaurs on land. Um, as long as it's relatively old, we consider it a fossil. Um, so actually, most of the stuff that I use hasn't had the chemical replacement, even though it's millions and millions of years old. In response to your specific question about how old do they have to be to be super compressed to turn into, say, rock, um, 
it really depends on where you are in the ocean floor. So I do a lot of work in really low sedimentation rate environments. Um, and there you might only get one meter of sediment accumulating every million years. And so those sediments don't ever compress hard enough to become rock because we just can't get deep enough. Um, but in other places, you might have, say, one meter per thousand years of sediments coming down. And it generally the rock inter, or the sediment rock interface is like somewhere between 200 and 400 meters down below the seafloor. Um, and so, you know, 200, if your, if your sedimentation rate is one meter every thousand years, it'll take 200,000 years. But if your sedimentation rate is one meter every million years, it might take 200 million years. And it's more just how much sediment is on top than how old it is exactly. And on the scale of deep time, what's another 200 million years? Um, <laughs> let's see. When you find individual ichthyoliths, are you able are you able to identify specific species that these uh, fossils come from? And yeah, this if is so. Excellent question. Ruda asks, what's what's what are some of the more exciting things that you found? Yeah, this is this is a really excellent question. So um, the answer is sometimes. Um, this has been a very, very large undertaking. There's 33,000 species of fish that live in the planet today. About half of those are marine. And so being able to identify something that's 55 million years old um, without any modern analog or fossil to go with it is a little bit of a challenge. That said, um, we're starting to be able to identify a couple of different groups. So I can identify a couple of the small we call them mesopelagic vertical migrating fish. That basically means fish that are living in the open ocean from about 200 to 1,000 meters of water depth that go up and down every day at night. Um, and so we can identify a couple groups of those. Um, one of the cool ones that we can identify that's really exciting is deep sea anglerfish. So those are the ones um, from Finding Nemo with the big lure that like um, goes along. They're actually like, this big or like four, four centimeters to 10 centimeters. They are not large fish, despite the fact that we think they're huge. Um, so we can identify some of them. Um, we can also identify a couple of the different sharks, um, but really this is very much the beginning. And um, the other thing that I will say that's a little bit of a challenge is that you can see behind me, I've got a bunch of teeth and they're all kind of pointy triangles. And so while some of the pointy triangles are identifiable, a lot of them show up in a lot of different fish. And so it's hard to say precisely, oh, this one belongs to this fish unless it's got some extra characteristic. Yeah, I bet. Um, okay, so our final question is, you mentioned that the, the Joides resolution was being retired and that we should all like support, support this work. How can we best do that? That is a great question. So one thing that's really, really good is like Google Joides resolution um, and learn about learn about the ship it's it's really quite a cool tool it's um frankly i i think it's it's cooler than hubble and it's more interdisciplinary than cern um it works with people with biologists with geologists with seismologists people can study earthquake hazards to like subsea floor bacteria um it's a really cool tool and so just go ahead and learn about it and if you're excited about it contact the, the, the representatives and tell them that you're excited about ocean drilling and this tool. And um, we are, we're doing our best to try and see what comes next, but it's a really cool tool. And it's a, it's, it really is, it's like, it's like Hubble, except it crosses like so many more disciplines. <laughs> and so we're, we're hoping that we can find a way to share how cool it is and see what moves forward. Yeah, absolutely. Cooler than Hubble. It's high praise. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing with us tonight. Um, up next, we will hear from Megan Rockner. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you once again to the California Academy of Sciences for inviting me to be part of the night school program. I am excited to talk about one of my favorite things, which is tree ring science, and also to be part of a sequence of talks that is titled Hardcore. Uh, that is pretty hardcore, and I'm excited to be here. 
So I wanted to talk today about adventures in tree ring science. This will include mostly the basics of tree ring science, what it is, and what are the different sorts of scientific applications that we can use tree ring science to investigate. I, again, am Dr. Megan Rockner. I'm from the University of Louisville uh, in Kentucky, but I'll be talking a bit about research that I've been doing all over. So, like Elizabeth, I wanted to start with a little bit about me. And a while back, as I was looking for pictures that I thought captured sort of who I am, I stumbled across this picture that a friend took of me while we were traveling in New Hampshire. And this is pretty typical how you're going to find me out in the wild. I'm either going to be hunched over uh, some stream, mainly looking at rocks, but also looking at trees. And I've been this way as long as I can remember. It took me a little bit too long to figure out it's what I could do as a career. Uh, but even as a little girl, you would always find me in my childhood streams, looking at rocks, catching crawfish. And it took me a minute. I actually progressed through a lot of different degree programs, including English and culinary arts and nutrition, before I found my way to uh, geosciences, geology and geography and ultimately to tree ring science, which I did not find until I was a graduate student at the University of Tennessee. And I, I also like to share this story because I think many people take a much more winding road uh, to where they are than is typically advertised. And a lot of times when I talk to students, I like to share my story that you may not have it all figured out right now and that's okay. You will end up where you're supposed to be. And so I'm here today to talk about where I ended up, which is in the discipline of tree ring science. That is my research specialty. And you will typically find me under the umbrella of geosciences or geography or environmental sciences. And, but the tool that I use, I like to think of tree ring science as a toolkit that I use to investigate a wide variety of questions. And honestly, anytime anyone around me, my colleagues have a question about the environment, I'm scheming a way that we can investigate that question using trees. Tree rig science is also known as dendrochronology. That's kind of the more official term, uh, but it's broken down into dendro for tree and chrono for time. Dendrochronology is the study of time through tree ring records. And tree ring science is defined as the science or technique of dating events, environmental change, and archaeological artifacts by using the characteristic patterns of annual growth rings in timbers and tree trunks. And this is in living trees, it's in dead trees and remnant wood that's long buried under the ground, and in archaeological timbers and other wooden cultural heritage that can be found anywhere we can find a tree ring that we can potentially investigate how that tree responded to environmental change. And we can use that response to understand how the environment and the climate has changed through time. So what tree ring scientists do in a sense is we use patterns in tree growth to understand past environmental conditions. We look at how trees have changed their growth rates through time. Uh, and we look for very specific indications of change in the records to think about things like climate, about disturbance and other things that are happening in the environment that trees are responding to. What is really nice about a tree is that it stays in one place for a very long period of time. If things get bad, the tree can't just pull up its roots and walk away. Uh, it can't migrate out of this scenario. And while tree species may migrate to new areas over time, a tree itself is stuck. And that tree can stay in one location for hundreds to thousands of years and it will record all of the things that happen around it. The other thing that is really nice about tree ring science is that it provides annual resolution and even sub-annual resolution. And what that means is that we can investigate environmental change down to the year it happened or even the season or time of year that it did. Uh, there is no plus or minus in tree ring science. It is this year or even this season. Now, many of you have probably you know, looked at a tree before, you've probably looked at a stump, especially and counted the tree rings. Or if you're like me, you're constantly looking for tree rings at the ends of the tables, at the bars and log cabins, and everywhere you go, you see tree rings. But many of you at one point have probably looked at a tree stump. 
uh, and looked at how old that tree is. Many people learn in grade school or high school that you can count the rings of a tree to understand how old it is. And this again is unique to trees that they have this annual resolution. They put on a ring every year and you can count those rings to determine age, but you can also look at how the tree growth has changed through time to understand past environmental conditions. So just like you looking at that stump, we take a core from a similar approach we call the cross-sectional view across all of those rings and we try to go perpendicular straight across the rings to the center of the tree we take this core we mount it and we sand it to near furniture polish where we can actually see the cellular structure of the tree rings until we can see that pattern of tree rings over time and we look at that pattern to investigate things like past climate change temperature, precipitation, drought. We can look at disturbance events. For example, in this example core that I've shown here, and I'll pause to clarify that this is an example of a coniferous tree or a conifer like a pine. And the light bands in this are the early wood it's called. This is the springtime to early summer growth. And the dark bands are the late wood. That's the late summer growth going into the dormant season over the winter. And so combined in this example are the light bands and the dark bands that equal one year. We look at changes in growth over time. For example, if you see a sudden and sustained decrease in the growth rate over time, this is something that we call a growth suppression. This could be caused by disturbance in the ecosystem. If it's unique to an individual tree, potentially that's some impact or trauma or event or maybe even a tree falling on another tree, or in some areas that I've studied before, debris from an avalanche or a landslide. If it's happening to a lot of trees, that helps inform us that it's a broader scale disturbance, potentially something like an insect outbreak. We can look at extreme years that are incredibly narrow that might indicate an extreme year in climate, like a drought year or an exceptionally cold year. Other things leave records in the tree rings that aren't necessarily just the width of the ring. Whenever a tree is injured in some way, the living tissue under the bark is killed or destroyed, it leaves a scar in the tree ring. And this could be a scar that's due, for example, to a fire. Uh, when fires move through, if they don't kill the tree, they burn part of that living tissue, which we call the cambium. Uh, and then the tree has to heal over that wound, sort of just like we do, uh, tries to close in that wound, but it can only close it a little bit year after year after year, till eventually sometimes it can close completely over that wound. But if it doesn't close that wound before the next fire, it'll actually get scarred again, leaving another scar indicating the next fire. And we could date these fires, for example, in this cross section that I have here to the year or even the season of the year that these fires occur. And we can use this information to understand how often fires occur in forest and other ecosystems and what is what drives those fires, the role of indigenous cultural burning, uh, the role of climate change and drought. What are the climate conditions that make these fires more likely? And also what for fire, how often they should occur in the system to maintain that ecosystem. There are many ecosystems that are fire dependent or fire adapted ecosystems that require fire. Sometimes we look at other anomalous growth in the tree ring record. And this is an example of a frost ring. A frost ring occurs when you have sudden cooling or freezing during the growing season that it's still actually something that's being studied, but essentially freezes the cells. Trees are pumping a lot of water through their cells during the growing season, and you get this sudden cooling event. And it's not necessarily understood whether it's more of an implosion or an explosion of the cells, but either way, it leaves this band of cellular damage in its wake. Uh, and it's pretty clear in the tree ring record when you can find it. Now, this is an example of a frost ring in whitebark pine from Wyoming that actually marked a cooling event resulting from a volcanic eruption in Indonesia. And I found multiple frost rings in my record that resulted from hemispheric scale cooling events following volcanic eruptions that were as far away as Peru or Indonesia.
And we can also look at tree rings to understand humans on the landscape. This includes human land use change. It can include humans role in fires on the landscape. And an example of how we might look at this is if a tree in an area is maintained through a period of land clearing all around it, that tree is gonna start growing faster because a lot of its competition has been removed. But if uh, over time that forest is allowed to close back in, if you have a period of reforestation, that tree that survived original land clearing will experience a slowing of growth as the canopy starts to close in back around it. So we can actually use tree rings to understand how humans are shaping and changing the environment through time. And so we go out into the field and we collect mostly live tree cores using what we call an increment borer. Uh, it's an entirely manual tool still at this point. There are people and colleagues of mine who are trying out chucks for power drills to try to expedite this process, but are still finding that you can't really get into the especially hard trees like oaks and hickories with that drill. But we're starting to figure out ways to speed up the process and especially make it more accessible to people who may not have the physical capability to do this work because it is rather gruesome sometimes to get these cores, especially out of hard ones. We mount them, we sand them up on the picture on the right. That's me sanding up an archaeological core using a bench sander in my backyard uh, until we can see those tree rings with pretty high precision. And tree ring rec uh, being a tree ring scientist has been amazing. It has allowed me to travel all over the country, especially. I haven't got to do much tree rings outside of the United States. But the picture in the upper left is me and some colleagues in the Florida Keys. We were investigating fire history. In the upper right was my master's thesis in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, investigating the frequency of landslide activity on Mount LeConte. The bottom left is me with a cross section from a remnant tree in the Beartooth Mountains of Wyoming near Greater Yellowstone uh, National Park. And there were these massive, massive trees that were way out in the middle of the meadow where trees of that same size don't exist anymore. And using those tree rings, we were actually able to investigate over a thousand years of climate change in the greater Yellowstone and also to understand what happened in that area that caused this woodland at tree line of these massive trees to die. In the bottom right is me coring live trees in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. We're investigating the influence of the urban heat island on urban trees and trees across the urban to rural gradient. Louisville, unfortunately, has one of the worst urban heat island effects in the country, and so that's really important to us here. And in the center, I have a picture of a core of an archaeological core, a little bit larger diameter. We do take this with a specialized drill bit and a power drill uh, from an archaeological timber. And that has been something I've been doing quite a bit of, especially here in Kentucky and in other states of the southeast, like Tennessee and North Carolina. Uh, is what we call dendroarchaeology or using tree rings to investigate the construction history and of structures but also artifacts like dugout canoes or wood panel paintings and in some cases even musical instruments. Uh, we don't take cores from musical instruments. There are ways that we can get at the tree rings without destroying any potentially incredibly valuable musical instrument. And one thing that I have found incredibly valuable about archaeological data is its ability to help us extend tree ring records in areas where living trees are relatively rare or non-existent. Now, you might be wondering, I've talked a lot about really old dead wood, uh, the samples in the Greater Yellowstone, these samples in a log cabin. How do I know what years are associated with the tree rings in those timbers? Uh, and the way that we do that is pattern matching, what we call cross-dating, uh, cross-dating between individual series from individual timbers. And it's essentially those statistical pattern matching. And the way that we date dead or remnant timbers is we match the patterns in those timbers against a living or already existent reference chronology for the area or region. As an example, I have a reference chronology at the bottom and what we call a floating chronology at the top, which could be an example, a chronology that we get from a historic structure. And what we do is we run those patterns 
through a system that finds the highest statistical match. I like to think of it like running a fingerprint through the system until it finds that thumbprint that matches. And once we do that, we have the absolute years for every tree ring in that record. And that provides us with the outer ring, which if we have bark or the outer surface of that timber is the cutting date of that tree, which informs when that building was potentially constructed or that artifact was made. In the area that I work in Kentucky, this has been really important for filling in data gaps in the state so that we can understand more about our state's history, but also past climate and environmental change. This is the International Tree Ring Data Bank. Uh, it's a global database. You can actually download this to look at in Google Earth. This is just sort of zoomed into the United States. Uh, and when you're zoomed out, it doesn't look too bad. It looks like there's pretty good coverage of everywhere in the US that has trees. But if you zoom into Kentucky, we only have four. We have four sites on the ITRDB, many of which only extend out to 1980. And there are a lot of areas for which we don't have any tree ring data. Uh, part of this is not many tree ring scientists working in this state. Part of this is lack of old growth. We don't have many old trees in Kentucky and a lot of eastern forest in the United States because of land use change, because of logging and timber, because of mining. A lot of our old forests have been lost. But we can still find those old tree rings in the historic structures and artifacts in those areas. And these are examples of historic structures that I've dated in Kentucky working to fill in those gaps in between all of those records that we have, those few four records that we have for Kentucky. And the big hope with this is that by using archeological timbers and also just finding old remnant wood where we can, we can build longer and longer tree ring records. And that can include overlapping live tree cores with archeological cores, with remnant wood like what I found in Wyoming with older timbers that are buried or potentially older archeological artifacts that we can find in the East, all with this effort to push tree ring records further and further back through time. And so I wanna sort of wrap up by talking about some applications of tree ring science. You know, what, do, what can we do with these long tree ring records once we have them? We can reconstruct climate. We can use that relationship between tree ring widths and particularly uh, particular climate variables to reconstruct and build a model of climate back through time. This is an example of the reconstruction of temperature that myself and colleagues built for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem for June, July, and August maximum temperature. And it shows positive and negative, negative anomalies in temperature over the summer. And you can see there have been warm and cool periods in the past, but right there at the end, you see that big spike of red that shows the warming that's been happening in the greater Yellowstone since 2000. And you can see that that warming is unprecedented in the last 1200 years for that area. We can understand disturbance and drivers, things like wildfires, insect outbreaks, and what were the climatic conditions? What were the human conditions that corresponded to these times? What is driving these disturbances? and how often do they occur in ecosystems. We can investigate how trees respond to environmental change and stressors. For example, how trees are responding right now to modern climate change, how they respond to things like the urban heat island effect, and also how they have responded to changes back through time. We can analyze the importance of trees within larger ecosystems. This picture is an example of work I've started in Eastern Kentucky to see if we can use tree rings to investigate the hydrologic connectivity of ridgetop wetlands in Daniel Boone National Forest and whether there's a big difference in constructed versus natural wetlands in the, that national forest. And we can investigate how humans have shaped the land over time. Uh, this is an example of what has been called a wolf tree or think of it like a lone wolf. These are really large trees and relatively young forests that were either yard or fence row or road lined or pasture trees that survived original land clearing and now are in a period of reforestation where the forest is closing back in around them. But they're amazing trees because you're just hiking along in what is relatively young forest and then you stumble across this really old gnarly oak uh, that's been there for a few hundred years and has seen a lot. And we look at how that tree has responded to those things. So in summary, trees help us understand the past, understanding how trees respond to change, how this varies by species and by environment. 
understanding climate and environmental extremes in the past and providing important context for what's happening now, understanding how often environmental events occur and what drives them, and understanding how current conditions compare to the past, all to really help us better predict the future. I wanted to just end with one of my favorite quotes and one that I stumbled across recently that I thought really captured what I do. Uh, if you haven't read Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, you should. Uh, and when I came across this quote, I thought how perfect for a tree ring scientist. Uh, it says, to me, an experiment is a kind of conversation with plants. I have a question for them, but since we don't speak the same language, I can't ask them directly and they won't answer verbally. But plants can be eloquent in their physical responses and behaviors. Plants answer questions by the way they live, by their responses to change. You just need to learn how to ask. Uh, and the way that I have learned to ask the plants uh, is through tree ring science, through investigating their eloquent responses. Thank you, everybody. Once again, I'm really happy to be here and happy to take your questions. I'll leave my contact information up for just a blip in case people want to email me after. Thank you. Hey, Megan. That was fantastic. Um, and Darian and I are like quietly fangirling behind the scenes over Robin Wall Kimmerer. Because, um, I mean, yeah, like what a what a phenomenal quote uh, to end a great presentation on. But anyways, we have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, the first one from Daniel uh, is, do tree ring features vary as a function of angle or position around the center of a tree? Like, do you have to take cores in multiple spots? Yes, they can vary a lot. Uh, even with a tree that's growing relatively straight, uh, it can vary on different sides of the tree, partly because the growth is driven by growth hormones that comes from the top of the tree down like melting wax, and it doesn't come down the tree perfectly consistently. Uh, and that can create variability around the circumference. Trees that are tilting either on a steep slope or have been pushed over by something uh, will create what's called reaction wood to upright themselves with which is different it can be very different on each side of the tree uh, and because of that variability we typically take a minimum of two cores per tree and we try to sort of average within the tree and then average across trees for a site to minimize the noise which is all the individual things that are happening uh, and maximize our signal which is typically climate but occasionally we actually want to investigate that in a way. So we don't completely discount that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And speaking of noise, um, Darian, my lovely co-host Darian, told me <laughs> that he had to take tree ring or tree cores in undergrad. And the borer made a little squeaky noise that attracted turkeys. Have you ever attracted turkeys? <laughs> I have not attracted turkeys, but what has been so charming is I've been doing more work around those ridgetop wetlands in Kentucky, and sometimes it sounds like a frog. It because of the friction, it like pop, 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 pop like that, uh, and the frogs actually started calling back to us, which is really sweet. <laughs> but also, we were probably really confusing them. I don't know what we were saying to the frogs, but they were calling back. <laughs> <laughs> Big conversation going on. <laughs> I love that. Um, and Mitzi asks about just interesting things that you've learned from wooden instruments. Um, you mentioned that you can also look at tree rings there. Oh, interesting things. It's always so amazing to hold something in your hands, you know, that was made by an artist in Europe in the 1500s, 1600s, maybe even older. And sometimes it's intimidating because they're potentially million of millions of dollars in value. And you're, you're, you're just a little like graduate student hoping you don't cause any damage. What is fun about working with instruments is typically we don't know where the wood came from. We might have an idea based on the potential artist, but they, you know, they chose wood very particularly based on species and wood density. In Europe, they liked high elevation, high density wood from trees that were growing in really harsh conditions to create a very unique and specific sound. And we actually do what's called dendro provenancing or, or finding the origins of wooden material by using that pattern matching across, we test across all of Europe to try to find out where the wood came from to make that musical instrument. Wow, that's cool. I'm, I'm a violinist, so I'm like <laughs> thinking about my own instrument too. That's, that's really cool. Um, and so do different species of 
trees all provide like different data then like or for a dendrochronologist like yourself are all trees kind of just like you know they they can provide very different information i mean if you just think about the landscape and trees different trees grow in different areas uh because you know, some trees are more or less sensitive to your particular condition. Some trees like it to be wet, and like the soil to be saturated. Some trees don't. Some trees like it to be a little cooler and drier and other trees like it to be warmer and wetter. Uh, and so because trees are growing in different environments, their responses are very different. And also sort of across their anatomy or physiology, they can respond differently to climate, especially, but anything else. And so you can get different pieces of information from trees. And just as a quick example, we've been coring mainly oak in Louisville to look at urban heat island because they're typically more responsive to climate. They're a little more drought tolerant and they're older, but we want to core another species, which is tulip poplar, uh, because it's a water loving species. It's nothing like oak in that way. And we want to see how they compare. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and then one more question. Uh, have you ever used museum collections to build out like the tree room record that you were talking about? I have not, but you can. So there are examples of this happening uh, across the globe in Europe and also in North America, where there are these collections of wood, some cases archeological wood, some cases, for example, one of the earliest dendrochronologists in the U.S. and the first one, of, I think the first a woman dendro archaeologist, Florence Hawley, worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority to collect archaeological wood in valleys that were getting ready to be flooded for the construction of dams and built this incredible archive of wooden material. And now there are archaeologists and dendrochronologists who are revisiting that archive to build records and investigate climate, environment, and humans in those areas. Wow, that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and then one final question before we close out, um, or we move to the next guest. Uh, any words of advice for people who want to become tree ring scientists? Words of advice for people on like a winding career path, kind of like you mentioned? Oh, I mean, well, first is it's okay to be on a, a winding career path to where you want to be. I, I stumbled across tree rings accidentally. I wanted to be a hydrogeologist and I just happened to talk to a tree ring scientist and we came up with a project to reconstruct landslides using trees. And I thought rocks and trees, I can do both. <laughs> and I was very excited. Uh, and you know, the rest is history. But I think an excellent resource actually, just to shorten up my time is the Dendro Hub. It's a website online. It's actually run by a great guy named Joe Buck. And he has collected where all of the tree ring labs are and you can look at other resources on tree ring science. It's a, it's a beautiful, excellent website. I highly recommend it if you're interested in learning more and also just finding out who should I reach out to if I wanna do this. Sweet, Dendro Hub, we'll, we'll put that in the comments for everyone to see too, but awesome. yeah. Thank you. Great, well, yeah, thank you so much, Megan. Um, that was fantastic. And next we're gonna have Claudia come up and talk about soil science. Hello, night schoolers. Um, thank you so much for sticking it out tonight. Um, and thanks so much to Darian and Aria for um, inviting me. Um, and to speak on today's uh, night school episode on all things cores. Um, as the title of my talk might give you some indication, um, you'll be hearing lots of puns tonight. Um, so um, just take that as a fair warning. Um, so my name is Claudia Cristina Avila, and I'm a postdoc um, at the Door School of Sustainability and Earth System Science. Um, and I am... Oh, so I am a soil biogeochemist. So um, if you're like me, you might be thinking like, that's a lot of syllables. Um, so I'll break it down. It's part biology, part geology, and part chemistry. Um, so um, if you're like me, you also might be thinking, well, those are three totally different 
um, fields of science. And this brings me to one of my favorite um, jokes. Uh, What's a biogeochemist? Three graduate students in a trench coat. Um, so really what it means is that um, I know just enough about microbes, rocks and minerals and the reactions that take place in soil to explain why soils are so cool. Um, so like my other co-presenters have mentioned about their life stories, I'd also like to point out that I hold a lot of other identities um, that um, not only inform my science, but also are part of um, my authentic self. Um, so I really like to say that I do soil biogeochemistry, but that's not who I am. Um, there are lots of other things that I, I am, and um, I have lots of names and identities that um, inform my science. So I'm a Chicana, um, I'm a first generation um, uh, st a student uh, and now postdoc. Um, I am a mother and um, I'm a roller skater. Um, I go by, by many names, um, but that's just uh, the other side of who I am and what informs my science. So many times when I tell people that I'm a soil scientist or a soil biogeochemist, they ask, isn't that just dirt? Um, and when I was, uh, you know, going through my soil science courses, um, I had a lot of professors say, don't say dirt because it's not really the same thing. So I kind of want to just give these two quick definitions on what's the difference between soil and dirt. So soil is a living entity that's continually developing. So it's this really natural um, body that's dynamic and it's developing over time. Um, and it's really this thin veneer that um, coats, um, coats the earth um, that is really critical for life on planet earth. Um, so how soils form is really dependent on um, several factors. There are five soil forming factors. So climate, organisms, um, where soils are on a slope, um, the type of rock that it's being um, produced from, and how much time has passed. Um, so one of the ways that I love um, kind of uh, sharing how soils form is using this example of, of weathering on a, on a block of ice. So for any of you um, that are familiar with um, raspados or shaved ice, um, you can kind of think of this block of ice as, um, as rock. And the weathering process is, the, is this um, tool that's going over the ice and creating this fluffy material that you get to eat. Um, in this case, it's soil. So as you know, um, soil is forming from rock that has, um, that has uh, uh, developed over time. And it really depends on these soil forming factors um, to produce all sorts of different soils. So oh, there's a quick video of what that might look like. <laughs> um, so um, soils come in a, uh, wide variety um, depending on how um, developed they are. So you can have some soils that are really young, which, um, you know, it could take several hundred to thousands of years to produce um, even, you know, an inch of soil. And then you can have some soils that are really deep and really well developed and also have this really amazing um, variety in the colors that you see. Um, so here's just an example of the 12 soil orders. And this is just a, a quick shot of the types of soils that we can see depending on those five soil forming factors. And um, dirt on the other hand is the that stuff that's um, not really in place. So um, soil is this living natural um, body that is really dynamic and dirt on the other hand is, you know, that remnant stuff that gets, you know, when you're sweeping that last bit of stuff that really won't um, you know, go into the d dustpan, that would be what is considered um, dirt. And if we look at this on a context of, um, of planet Earth, um, soil is this really, we have to zoom in um, pretty close to, to the Earth's surface to see um, where this um, veneer, this, um, this material is collected. Um, and it's this critical lens between the atmosphere and the subsurface. And it's really essential for um, life on planet Earth. And um, why should we even care about soils? So you might not 
have ever thought about um, the ecosystem services that soils provide, um, but we use soils for a number of reasons. So one, um, one thing you might be thinking of is like food security. We grow our crops. Um, uh, soils are the medium for growing crops. Um, they're also... Um, uh, water moves through soils, so they can also act as a purification system for our water supply um, uh, to groundwater aquifers. Um, they also take a, a huge role. They're the largest terrestrial um, carbon sink on Earth, um, uh, on land. So uh, soils can store carbon as opposed for as opposed to carbon um, being released out into the atmosphere, um, and we can. We can build stuff on soil, so um, how the properties of that soil and the foundation you're building on is really important. Um, so there's lots of different reasons why we use soils and um, really what makes life possible. Um, so when preparing this talk and, you know, going hardcore, um, I kind of wanted to reach out to my, my soil um, community and I asked them, hey, do you have any pictures of cool soil cores? Um, and I got a really amazing response um, from a lot of friends. And the reason I asked um, my soil community um, about soil cores is um, this whole term of, um, of soil science is, a, is an umbrella of a variety of different, a variety of different um, subdisciplines within soil science. So the reasons why we collect sores and how we collect sores is going to be different depending on the types of questions that we're asking. So for a soil physicist or, um, and um, hydrologist, they might wonder how water is moving through um, different layers in the soil, and um, so we want to know, you know. What is the, the question that you're asking, um, you know, to get your soil? Um, so how do we take a look at soil? So soil is this, um, I, I mentioned it's this, um, it's this body, it's a 3D um, dynamic living component of, of earth. Um, and how do we actually take a look at it? Um, so one of the, the um, metaphors that I like using is when you just take a quick soil sample, um, say you're just collecting the surface um, of the soil, it's kind of like just taking um, a peek at your skin. It might give you some indication on um, health, but it's not going to give you the whole story without taking it into account all of the other factors and how that soil um, is deposited, how um, water moves, and um, all of the other properties that, um, that create that that unique soil. Um, so one of the ways that we look at soils, um, if you're lucky enough, you can um, rent a backhoe and um, you know just start digging. Um, it's one of the, I think, most satisfying things um, as a soil scientist is to just go out and have some machinery with you to, to um, dig out some soil pits um, and kind of take a look at a soil profile, which is just one face um, of the soil. Um, other other ways that we can um, take a look at soil is um, through other heavy machinery. So we can um, use some hydraulic um, kind of uh, pressure um, to to kind of take a quick um, stab at our soil. Um, but sometimes, uh, depending on where you're working, um, uh, you know, having a backhoe or or any big machinery is not really um, uh, feasible or not possible. Um, so one of the most classic um, ways of getting soil cores and, and extracting your soils is using an auger. Um, so here's a picture of um, Dr. Allison Markline who presented at the last um, night school event with an auger to penetrate down into the soil. Um, and here's some pictures um, that friends have, have sent of actual soil cores where they're going pretty deep. You can just see, you know, um, here, the, the change in color as you go down in depth um, is, is really interesting. Um, here are some additional photos um, that friends have sent. Um, you can see that soil isn't really just all, um, it's not the same um, as you go um, deeper into the soil. Um, and here we have other beautiful, I just think it's just um, really spectacular to see all of the color differences where organic matter is, is littered at the top. You can have some areas where you have pre-deposited organic matter that was maybe buried. 
um, and um, uh, here are some beautiful um, sandy soil cores taken from a site where you can see even soils taken from in close proximity can differ depending on the vegetation that's above it. Um, so here's just a really prime example of soils um, being very different in the same region. Um, here's just another example um, of these soil, um, really sandy cores taken from an ecological site in New Mexico. Um, this one is probably my favorite um, image of this hydric soil where you can see this red and gray um, portions of the soil. And that is um, an indication of, of redox features. So um, zones where you have oxidation and reduction happening, where um, the soil might have might be inundated with water. Um, you, can, you can see how water might be moving through the soil just by looking at the, um, looking at the soil. Here's a, a really beautiful core. Um, it's a permafrost active layer um, uh, soil core from Alaska um, that's pretty intact. Here's another beautiful um, visual of um, where you can actually see um, where groundwater might be fluctuating with, within this grassland. Um, you can see these redox features. And um, I mentioned that um, uh, the soil forming factors, one is topography. So where, um, where that soil is being developed. So if it's on the top of a hill versus, um, you know, down in a valley, you're going to have different depths of soil. So here's just a really great, um, you know, visual of what soil might look like on a summit um, versus uh, on the foot slope. So right in that valley, you have much deeper soil. There's much more organic matter. There's, um, you can see this much darker um, color um, right at the top. Um, and just this, this huge variety in, in the depth. Um, um, and that really, uh, you know, is dependent on the topography. And um, here on the left, I have a visual of um, some burning experiments that I did um, with uh, the same soil, and it was just burned at different temperatures. And you can see this um, variety of color. Um, and um, the, I just wanted to kind of point out that soils, you know, when I used to think of soils, I would just think of, you know, brown. Um, or maybe like some um, variety of, of brown, but soils are really can um, have a, a huge um, span of, of different colors and minerals um, and their visual indications of environmental, um, of environmental factors. And here um, is uh, me and my colleagues at Stanford um, collecting some soil cores um, out in the rain. And I just wanted to kind of emphasize that, um, you know, sometimes when we don't have this heavy machinery um, to go out and collect um, soil cores, it's just, um, you know, whatever strength you have to, to kind of push in a um, push in a rod into the ground. So here's um, Dr. Alondra Lopez kind of just with all her might um, pushing down into the soil to get these, um, these really um, amazing intact cores. And some of my previous work, um, uh, you can do, do um, different types of analyses on soil cores. You can do some stuff that's in situ. So um, keeping a core in place and then taking some measurements. Um, so I, my dissertation work was on um, carbon dynamics in soils, so how carbon is stored in soils. And I was, um, I used these cores that were in place and um, utilized these, um, these CO2 chambers um, to measure the change in, in um, respiration over time um, under different uh, watering conditions. Um, I can also take soil cores from the field and uh, manipulate them in the lab. So um, my experiments were on wetting, wetting up soil at different rates and then measuring how much um, carbon was released from the, the um, application rate of water. Um, so there's really a huge, um, you know, uh, span of things that you can do with soils. Um, and really the, the difficult thing is um, because soils are these 3D bodies, um, taking cores is a, one of the, the best ways to, to kind of um, take a snapshot of what, kind of what kinds of processes are happening below ground. Um, so 
I wanted to end with, you know, what is the core of all of this? <laughs> it's the last pun, I swear, um, is that um, soils are this thin veneer which life depends on. Um, and, you know, just go out and take a look at your soil um, and kind of appreciate some, you know, the dirt below you. So um, I'd like to thank um, the organizers, um, Darian and Aria, for the invitation. I've included some, um, some ways that you can keep in contact, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Claudia, for that phenomenal presentation. Might have been your last core pun, but Aria and I still have a couple more coming down the pipeline, <laughs> so don't uh, expect some more. OK, we have some great questions from our audience, uh, but I would encourage everyone to continue to ask very thoughtful questions. Um, Dorothy asks if soil microbes have the capacity to kind of affect what plants can grow in the soil or how they grow. How much does variety in soil affect how plants are able to grow? Yeah, so soils are really, um, there are so many different microbes um, that live within soil. So it's estimated that about one tablespoon um, of soil will have anywhere between 10,000 um, unique species, um, up to a billion individual species um, living within it. So soils are really this great unknown. Um, there are definitely a huge um, variety of studies that are um, specific on how this um, the community assemblages of, of soils might influence, say, um, uh, um, like crop growth, um, any symbiotic relationships that might um, benefit plants, um, plant growth. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, research in that area. Oh, exciting. Um, Tom wants to know how far back in time can soil cores take you? Yeah, so um, we would say um, for a young soil, like a, an, uh, an entosol, um, a, a brand new baby soil, um, it still takes hundreds of years for about an inch of that soil to be, um, to be formed. So like I, I mentioned with the um, um, you can kind of think of the rock being that ice and you're making the shaved ice. Um, that weathering process, physical or chemical, anything that's breaking up that rock into smaller and smaller particles, even um, water droplets. So as water is hitting soil, that's um, physically and chemically um, reacting with that surface and it's, um, it's breaking up into smaller bits. Um, so it takes hundreds of years, but most, you know, um, for a really developed soil, also um, the weather, like the, the climate conditions um, influence how um, like deep your soil is. So you can have a young, deep soil, um, but it's just because there's a lot of weathering processes that are happening that are making this really um, deep soil. Um, so it can range, but soils are, are uh, depending on where where you're um, looking, um, you can have anywhere between a, you know several hundred years old to millennia. Wow, yeah, I guess I definitely don't appreciate so often the the complexity of what's going on below my feet. That's amazing. Um, Mitzi notes that recently Lake Mead was uh, very very low, and she wonders like if you were to take soil samples from what has historically been like the bottom of a lake bed, would it look any different than uh, soil that is typically above water? Yeah, so um, one of my um, close friends um, and colleagues, uh, um, Dr. Alex Free, actually um, worked on um, the Salton Sea, which is another great example of, say, a disappearing lake and what happens to um, to soils and, um, you know, uh, at the bottom of lake beds, we find really fine material. Um, so that fine material, when it um, uh, when you have a lake starting to recede, that fine material and dust is really um, uh, 
it, it can erode really easily with wind. So um, a lot of these playa or, or dry lake beds, um, the really difficult thing is not only um, the like particulate matter that's being formed um, by any wind erosion um, from those lake beds, um, but also what's the composition of the material there. So if you have a lake that was a deposit area for agricultural runoff, um, for any industry where you have maybe some um, heavy metal contaminants or any um, organic contaminants, um, you might be um, now exposing the stuff that was formerly under a lake bed and kind of sealed away. Now it's, it's being, um, you know, people can essentially breathe it in. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, in a lot of the, the cores that you shared images of, there was a lot of color and textural variety. And mm -hmm. when I, who am not a soil biogeochemist, think of soil, it's often in relation to like gardening or agriculture. And I think of mm -hmm. like dark, loamy soil as like good soil. Mm -hmm. Is there such thing as good soil or am I kind of misattributing value there? Um, so it generally um, depends on what you're what you would consider health. So as an ecosystem property, um, you might be wondering how many, how much nutrients are being stored um, within your soil and that might make it healthy. Um, but there's also like a healthy soil for say agriculture is very different than what a healthy soil would be for a natural ecosystem. Um, so it definitely depends on the context of what is a good soil. Um, but Soils come in so many varieties, you can, um, there's a purpose for every type. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I'm glad someone is like paying close <laughs> attention to this. Um, let's see. Uh, what about your story? How did you come to be a soil biogeochemist? Um, so my family is, um, so my mom grew up in Mexico and um, were uh, farmers. And so when my mom came to the US, um, my, my mom taught me how to garden. So I was really um, just always outside and in the garden. Um, so when I was, I started actually in community college. And when I was there, I um, was really into sustainability. And um, the sustainability club on campus was also um, trying to create a garden. And since I loved gardening, um, I kind of just moved into um, into kind of, um, it just happened, opportunities came up and I, I found my way to soil science. It wasn't necessarily like I knew I wanted to do soil science. Um, I just had opportunities that opened up. Yeah, wow. It's, yeah, it's amazing how all of, all of our presenters tonight have found like such incredible niches like in, in this world. Um, Thank you so much, Claudia, for presenting tonight. We so appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and with that, I will bring Aria back. Dancing behind the scenes. Um, I mean, the music is so catchy. Um, we would like to extend like a massive thank you to Elizabeth, Megan, and Claudia. Um, I, all I do is learn and smile when we host these. This is, it's amazing. Mm -hmm, truly. Um, yeah, we, we adore cores. Um, we've loved hearing each and every one of your stories. And we here at Night School are live on the third Thursday of every month, which means that we'll be back here on May 18th next, which also happens to be International Museum Day. Yay. Um, and we do in fact come to you from a natural history museum. Cal Academy. And so we are gathering experts from three other museums on that night to share about some of their work that's changing what it means to care for scientific collections and tell stories as a natural history museum. And please join us and uh, celebrate that worldwide day, International Museum Day on May 18th um, for a program that we are calling Night School not uh, making natural history. That could have been a really clean delivery. And then I <laughs> doubted myself on it. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Don't worry about it. As long as you do it confidently. As I uh, subscribe to the California Academy of Sciences YouTube channel. So you'll be notified every time that night school is in session. 
recordings of every night school stay on our YouTube in perpetuity, which means they will never go away. So you can feel free to rewatch old episodes at any time from anywhere on earth. You can send them to friends or family. We have a playlist. It goes back like three years. You could take a core of that and see like all the <laughs> things that we've done on night school. 84 episodes. Um, 84 episodes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you again all for joining us and have a great night. Take care. Good night.